second of two finishing talks. I think that's actually unprecedented, certainly in my experience here. So um, some of you may not know that he gave a first finishing talk, not the same talk, a different talk, to IB. It was like two or three weeks ago. And uh, when he gave that talk, I gave him the formal introduction, you know, kind of the professional introduction, where I went on and on <laughs> espousing, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, Dan's, uh, you know, greatness as a graduate student in the program. And I, so I will reiterate a little bit of that, but I can't do that and show you some pictures of Dan from the field. So, uh, so I'm going to keep the professional introduction a little bit shorter and, uh, and try to skip ahead to the, to the less professional one. So, uh, so, you know, Dan did his undergrad at John Carroll University. And this is something that I know he's quite proud of because he continues to interact with that program. Uh, in, in, I think, really interesting and important ways, helping promote undergraduate research there and that sort of thing, which is really cool. Uh, after he finished his undergrad degree there, he went to Villanova University, and many of you probably don't know, the non-herpetologists here, that they have a really excellent program in herpetology. It's a terminal master's program, and one of the best. And so Dan went there and did his master's work there, and that's where he started working in Africa. Uh, so he worked on trachelipa skinkhead phylogeography uh, while he was there. And, uh, and became committed to African herpetology, which of course is going to be the topic of, of his, uh, his presentation today. And then in 2009, he arrived here, and he continued working in Africa, and, uh, and you know, has, been, has been really amazingly productive as a student here. So I will you know, tell you that he's had, I think, 15 publications. Is that, the, is that the total now? It's like every month there's another one. <laughs> so it's 15. So 15 publications. That's a lot of publications for a PhD student. I mean, those are 15 peer-reviewed publications, and I think 10 of them are first authored papers. Um, so uh, obviously he's been very effective. He had an NSF pre-doctoral fellowship. Uh, sorry, he had an NSF dissertation improvement grant, which I think is more important than the pre-doctoral fellowship. <laughs> and, uh, and also he had two Philomathia fellowships here. He's won speaking awards at conferences. He's basically done everything that you could hope a, a graduate student would do in the program. Um, so that, that's the professional introduction. This time, I really wanted to provide a more personal introduction. And um, yeah, it's easier to do when you've been in the field with your students. And surely, you know, Dan and I, can we turn the lights down a little bit for these photos? I think they'll be better, a little less light. So you know, we've been in the field together, right, with my herpetology class. He GSI'd my class a few times, where he was, again, excellent. And, uh, and sure, you know, field work on, you know, you get to catch some herps, and you see cuddly. Kangaroo rats and things like this, but this doesn't really show you, you know, that you know what true like hardcore remote international field work is like. And unfortunately, I haven't done that field work with Dan, and so I had to put out a request for photos from a few of the, the key people that he's done field work with in Africa. And he's been on eight expeditions to Africa as a student here, right? So a massive field program as well. Um, and so those people, uh, David Blackburn was a good source of photos, and Adam Lachey and Ben Evans, they all sent me photos of Dan, which I strung together here. Now the problem is that they didn't really send me any kind of description or definition of what was going on in these photos, and so I had to come up with my own explanation. So, so this is what I'm going to do. I think the story makes sense, but it's going to be my interpretation of these photos. Um, so we'll start off with a photo of Dan working in the field. You know, when I see a picture like this, I think about, you know, the thing we say when we're in the field in Southeast Asia all the time, which is they wouldn't, they don't call it field play, it's field work. And you can see that Dan is a little bit, maybe a little grumpy in this room, right? He doesn't look like he's having a great time because he's working. It's actual field work. And, you know, it's difficult to move frogs from one bin to the next. <laughs> Here's Dan again. <laughs> Poking frogs with a pair of forceps. Obviously, he's not super happy about it because it's hard work. It's difficult work. I have another picture. Of this. So it's a little. So my interpretation of this is that he's just grappled with this crocodile. I see it's a crocodile. And, uh, barely survived the encounter. You can see the bloody finger. But he managed to control the beast, and, uh, and he's feeling a little bit, you know. He's, he's not joyous, he's when he's, but he survived the experience. And I'm sure, is this a specimen now? This? I've never seen this photo. <laughs> it's a very nice photo. Yeah, that's, that's, it's a specimen now. Yeah. Excellent. So it was worth the battle. So, so, uh, you know, so what I really wanted from these photos was to figure out, you know, really what it takes to be a leader of men in Africa. And, uh, and so, you know, I know, oh, what? 
one more work photo. So this is a so David Blackburn sent me this photo. Many of you've probably seen this one before. This is Dan pulling a barge across the river. And, uh, and and David Blackburn's comment was that he thought this was a nice metaphor for a PhD, <laughs> which I think is true. So these were pictures of Dan working in the field rather than than sort of leading. And the other pictures that I have are more sort of leadership sorts of pictures. So one of the things that you have to do if you're going to lead men in the field is you have to feign joy. <laughs> so this is Dan you know, feigning joy over this, this uh, butterfly. We all know that he would rather have a frog in his hand than that butterfly, but he's trying to inspire the troops. I have another picture of him feigning joy. This is, a, this is at a restaurant, I think, right? So feigning joy about the prospect of eating. <laughs> feigning joy over the prospect of drinking a Fanta. <laughs> and just generally feigning joy. I think all of the feigning joy scenes happen in restaurants. <laughs> African dust. I'm wearing makeup. <laughs> is that why this photo was taken? Because you're covered with dust. Yeah. Nice. Alrighty. So, you know, of course, if you're going to be a, a leader in Africa, you have to provision your team, right? And so I have a, this is well documented in the photographs. So this is the first photo of Dan. He's, he's captured some, some pineapples, which is going to be his team. I have another picture of him with, the, with a giant edamame. Obviously, this thing had the team for like a week or two. <laughs> I mean, this is like Photoshop, right? This is a, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, see? This probably kept the crew catching frogs for a week or two at least. Um, occasionally you have to provide your crew with meat. So here he is with, with some meat for the team. Very nice, Dan. <laughs> now, just feeding the team probably isn't enough to keep everybody property motivated, so there also has to be some sort of, you know, <laughs> Grandstanding type behavior, you know, epic sort of um, you know, activity motion to keep people going. So here he is, you know, obviously cajoling the team to run into the grass there and look for frogs. This picture is one of my favorites. I think this was actually used as a poster that they put up around camp to keep people motivated. <laughs> Probably, right? Sure. And, uh, Another night. This is just a nice photo of Dan, right? Very sweet photo of Dan with the hippopotamus skull. I'm sure this also motivated your, your teammates. Now, if, <laughs> if iconic images aren't enough to motivate your team, there's always threats. And, and when I saw this picture, I figured there was no chance that I wasn't signing off on his dissertation. This, this convinced me, and it was good tactics, actually, to have this photo sent to me to make sure that I would actually sign off on his dissertation. I have that machete in my house. <laughs> that, scary, that scary demeanor? I still have that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and then just the last picture, I think, you know, this is just to show that Dan is obviously one of the luckiest herpetologists on earth. Who wouldn't want to have a face covered with brucassia? These are brucassia, I assume, or are they Rampholian? With Rampholian dwarf chameleons. Very nice. So that's the end of my, uh, my photo <laughs> documentation of your field work in Africa. And now Dan's going to tell us about the actual research that he did in Africa. And uh, again, you've been an awesome graduate student, and uh, it's really cool to, to, well, it's cool and sort of bittersweet to see it coming to an end at this moment. We were talking about this in my office last night. You know, Dan's basically going to blast off to, you know, to uh, Arlington, where he has a postdoc lined up with Matt Fujita and Adam Lachey, and he's going to be leaving quite soon. So. It's the end of an era here within the program, and um, the floor is yours now. The final talk. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any way we could try and dim the lights a little bit more? I don't know if these go off or not, but I have some quite an array of pictures that I'd like to show off. All right, well, it's a real privilege to be standing up here today. Um, as Jim mentioned, I, I did give another departmental finishing talk. And uh, I, to be honest, I was looking forward to this one more because, <laughs> don't tell the department, but I mean, this is a room that's usually filled with my advisors, my colleagues, and my closest friends. And so this is a really fantastic seminar series. And it's my opportunity to really explain to you what I've been up to over the last few years. And in my departmental seminar, I tried to focus on sort of the overall broad scope of my research program and some of the work that I've done as a graduate student. But for this particular seminar, I just want to focus on the system that I've been working really hard to develop. And this is focused on the, the hyperolate frogs in Africa. 
So the family Hyperoleidae is Africa's largest of the frog families. There's over 230 species and many undescribed forms remaining. They have a distribution across sub-Saharan Africa, but they're also found on Madagascar and the Seychelles Islands. <coughs> Hyperoleids are found in a variety of habitats and altitudes, but they exhibit the highest species richness in forest areas. So these are both lowland rainforests and montane forests. And as many as 14 species have been recorded in Sinpatry. That's direct Sinpatry. And species show high turnover based on um, elevational gradients and habitat gradients. Hyperlates do exhibit some morphological diversity, but in general, they're arboreal species. Um, just looking at these pictures, perhaps the most striking feature is their bright coloration. And this can be highly variable and driven by both color polymorphism and sexual dichromatism. Um, making them particularly challenging to identify in the field, um, which has been plaguing this group for, for quite a long time. But within the family, there are essentially three large subclades, and I want to define those now because I'll be talking about them for the rest of the, the seminar here. The first group are the cassinoids, and these are three photos of, of those um, particular frogs. And so there's about 25 species in this group, and this, this is actually the only clade that contains terrestrial forms. Um, the genus of Frixlis, these, are, these three photos are representatives of this group. Um, these are um, tree frogs, and they're, they tend to be smaller in size. And then the, perhaps the, the biggest and most enigmatic group is the genus Hyperoleus. So with the Frixlis, there's only 30 species in our arboreal, but the arboreal Hyperoleus, there's over 140 species. And this is the group that has the most variation in terms of color pattern and, uh, and uh, geographic variation. So there's a lot of reasons why um, I'm interested in hyperoleids as a system, but my goal today is really, instead of kind of going through everything that I want to talk about and study in my career, is just to introduce you to the system and describe a couple of the things that I've done in my dissertation. And I'm not trying to, to say that we know all the answers to these <coughs> questions, it's really the beginning of a lot of work. And so this is sort of a foundation in which I'm planning to build um, during my career. So there's a few bullet points that I want to cover today. Um, first, I need to talk about the phylogenetic <coughs> relationships of the group and how I came to reconstruct those. And then um, after that, I want to focus on sexual dimorphism in the group, and in particular, size dimorphism and dimorphism in coloration, and sort of explain some of the unique characteristics of hyperoleids with regard to those. So in my departmental seminar, I spent a lot of time talking about um, some of the challenges of working with a group that's distributed across sub-Saharan Africa. And I spent a lot of time talking about the genomic approach I took to, uh, to collecting molecular data. But I'm just going to kind of quickly summarize what I did here um, and sort of move on from there. But essentially, there's, there's two large problems with this group, historically. First is the species sampling, and then the second component is the collection of molecular data and how to do that effectively for such a large group. Now, in terms of species sampling, I've been leading um, an international collaboration. And so far, we have about 32 researchers involved. These are all researchers who have strong field, uh, field work components in their research programs. Um, and I do want to highlight a couple of these researchers who have been instrumental. Um, first is Raina Bell. And Raina and I originally sort of came together and, and tried to come up with a strategic plan for getting this phylogeny done. And she's been absolutely instrumental in facilitating a lot of these collaborations especially the international ones. And the second person is David Blackburn, um, former curator at the, the Calicad. And Dave's been instrumental in really bringing me into the field and allowing me to do a bunch of this work, as well as introducing me to the community of African herpetologists. So with this um, massive effort, we now have sampling that spans 20 years of field work and 27 countries. Um, and this is not possible unless we have this large scale collaboration. And as a result of that, I've been able to, to sequester 1,300 tissues. And that's a result of my personal field work as well as people sending samples. And so primarily what I did um, for the first few years here was, was DNA barcode those samples, really to establish lineage identifications and figure out how much diversity is actually present in the family. And with that level of sampling, I was able to go ahead and, and begin my, uh, my next generation sequencing molecular data collection. And so there's a lot of approaches that people can use uh, now involving high throughput sequencing mm -hmm. to generate large quantities of molecular data for big groups. Um, the approach that I chose is transcriptome-based exon capture. And this is an approach that was developed in the MVZ, and it's something that the McGuire Lab is really working on now 
um, to develop further with a lot of our projects. And for this particular experiment, I included 254 samples. And the number of species in there, it depends on how you look at it, but I would say anywhere between 140 and 170 species total. And that's of the 230 names that exist for the group. And at the end of this experiment, I obtained over 1,000 loci and over 630,000 base pairs of DNA information. And um, as I said, I, I spent a lot of time talking about the details of this approach during my departmental seminar. But uh, recently, um, myself, Lydia Smith, and KB have um, submitted a manuscript for publication that describes the method. And so if you're interested in the details, the preprint of that is now available on BioArchive. And I'd be happy to talk about this after the talk um, today, but I really don't have time to kind of go into the details. But the end result is we get all this, um, this uh, you know, genetic information, and we want to create the phylogeny for the group. And I did this using both concatenation and species tree methods. And these two different approaches basically gave me similar results overall, especially for these, these deeper nodes in the phylogeny. And so now I have this really well-resolved tree, <coughs> which I can use to start doing sort of comparative evolutionary studies within the group. And um, I'm just going to color code a couple of clades and keep that consistent throughout the talk. So the green here refers to the cassinoids. Orange is that genus of Frixlis. And this really large clade, which is blue, these are all the hyperoleus. And there's a lot of really interesting sort of biogeographic things happening and species relationships, which I, I just simply can't talk about today. But the point is, this is really a foundation for a lot of other studies. But today, I'm going to be focusing on some traits that are um, really interesting in the group. And so I'm going to start out with uh, sexual size dimorphism. Now, over the course of my, my various <coughs> work expeditions, I've encountered a few frogs that are in amplexus. This is kind of rare in general to find, and you have to be during the mating season at the right place at the right time. But in <coughs> capturing a, um, a number of these individuals um, in this behavior, I've noticed that there's quite a lot of variation in body size between the sexes. And this ranges from males being, being quite small relative to the females, all the way up to males that exceed the size of the females. And so given this high variation, they're a really interesting system for investigating the patterns of sexual size dimorphism. That and the fact that there's over 200 species makes it a really, really neat system. But um, sexual size dimorphism is really a composite character, and it's the result of the combination of both male and female body size. And I think um, anyone who's really been interested in sexual size dimorphism would agree that what we're really interested in are the selective forces that are driving body size evolution in each of the sexes independently, and really figuring out how that contributes to this composite character. Um, and before I jump into sort of what I did with this system, I want to back up a little bit and just describe what we know about sexual size dimorphism for frogs more generally, and a few of the topics that have been explored that sort of characterize um, this particular trait in frogs. So one of the first most basic questions is simply whether the system is male or female biased in terms of dimorphism. Are males always larger? Are females always larger? And um, you know, sexual selection theory would predict that male bias size dimorphism can occur when larger males have a reproductive advantage in competing for mates or as a result of female bias. <coughs> um, female bias size dimorphism is most generally explained by um, selection for larger females because of increased fecundity. Now in frogs, they're predominantly female biased. So of the 600 or so species that have been surveyed, 90% of them exhibit female bias dimorphism. Um, and usually the explanation here is increased fecundity. Now uh, there, there are some species in which males are the, the larger sex. And here, sometimes the explanation is combat between males. But a recent study has actually demonstrated that there's no correlation between combat behavior and uh, male bias sexual size dimorphism. So I don't think we really know um, the true explanation for what's driving this pattern. Another way to sort of approach this is to look at um, the relationship between the scaling of the body sizes and whether there's an allometric relationship or an isometric relationship. So one macroevolutionary pattern um, of sexual size dimorphism is Wrench's rule. And this states that typically when the males are the larger sex, the sexual size dimorphism will increase as the species gets larger overall. And um, this is the result of stronger selection on the male body size, and the males get disproportionately larger relative to the females as the species size increases. And if females are the, the larger sex, 
the sexual size dimorphism will actually decrease because the males are sort of catching up to the female body size. Um, and you can also have the converse of this rule too, but in general, the allometry, so any kind of allometric relationship, is really implying that there's stronger selection on one of the sexes. In meta-analyses of frogs, it doesn't appear that the extent of sexual size dimorphism increases with larger species. And in fact, the relationship is isometric. And so this is inconsistent with Wrench's rule, a, a rule that's widely upheld in a lot of mammals and birds and, and other terrestrial vertebrates. And finally, uh, an important note here is that changes in sexual size dimorphism can result from increases or decreases in the size of either sex, as well as stochastic evolution, because this is a composite character. And so a fundamental question is simply, what is the overall evolutionary tendency of the male and the female body size? And this is a pattern that hasn't been well explored in frogs and requires you know, very careful sampling, phylogenetic relationships, and a lot of body size data. Um, but I think that this is a really promising and more powerful approach to investigating the selection on, on male and female body size. And I'll say that across all of the studies that I've seen for frogs, the most comprehensive studies have only included eight species of hyperoleids of the 230 that are possible. And so within <coughs> hyperoleids, this is really an open question of what's happening. And so for this portion of the talk, um, for my dissertation chapter, I really focused on three main questions, um, sort of kind of in line with what I just listed. So first, what are the levels of sexual size dimorphism among hyperoleids? Second, what type of scaling relationship exists between the body sizes of the sexes? And these two questions are really to sort of characterize the system. And the third approach, what are the patterns of body size evolution of the sexes, is a much more focused question. Um, and it's really getting at sort of the underpinnings of, of who's actually changing size <coughs> relative to who. So I do have the phylogeny, um, but again, the main limitation <laughs> for these kinds of studies are, are the body size data. And so I've been using specimens that myself and other researchers have deposited at natural history collections to measure as many species as possible over the last few years um, to collect these kinds of data. And in total, I measured over 2,700 specimens. A lot of these came from the California Academy of Sciences. They have a really awesome collection of hyperoleids from Africa. But there are um, also many hyperoleids in the MVZ as well as uh, the <coughs> Museum in Washington. And so from this data set, I had 137 lineages with at least one male and one female, which would allow some kind of comparison between the sexes. And of those, 110 of those taxa were present in my phylogenetic data set, which will allow me to use phylogenetic <coughs> methods to really assess um, the patterns of evolution. And so I ended up using these 110 taxa for the following um, results. And so rather than give sort of an overview of my, my methods, I'm just going to sort of present results and describe the methods as I go along to answer each of these questions. But in general, the methods um, will be cited at the bottom corner of my slides. So if you're interested in the details, um, you know exactly what, what I've been doing. Okay, so for the first question, simply what are the levels of sexual size dimorphism among hyperoleids? I really had no idea. I knew there was a lot of variation, but it hadn't been quantified. <coughs> And so what I'm showing here is the ancestral reconstruction of the sexual size dimorphism index across species in the phylogeny. And the different colors represent different values. So red indicates male bias dimorphism, so males are the larger sex. Orange and yellow are approximately equal sizes between the sexes. And green is uh, female bias dimorphism, and blue is sort of the most extreme of the female bias dimorphism species. And rather than focusing on the ancestral estimates, more so I think this is actually just a nice tool for visualizing the distribution of the traits across the phylogeny. And the overall range of the size dimorphism index for hyperoleids is well within the range uh, established for all frogs. And the average value is very close to the average value of all frogs. So there's not something particularly unique about this clade. Um, but you can see, in general, though, given the color scheme, that a majority of these species are female bias in terms of dimorph dimorphism. But there are a number of occurrences where males are the larger sex. There's very low phylogenetic signal in this trait, which was kind of surprising to me. And then, to me, that suggests that <coughs> shared relationships are not the main explanation for the patterns that we're seeing here, but there's more to it than just that. So this is kind of a nice first pass at things. Um, one, of the, one of the things I did just with this data to follow up was to look at the range of variation occurring within each of the subclades that I listed before. 
So I, I totaled up the total range of the cosinoids, um, of Frixlos, and Hyperoleus. And the results were a little bit surprising to me. And so the total numbers um, are listed for each of these, the, the complete range. But the most important number is the blue number, which represents the span of the index. And the maximum was, I think, 0.52. And if you notice, the range in the cosinoids in a Frixos is really quite <coughs> narrow. But if you look in Hyperoleus, they really go the full distribution of size dimorphism. So these are species that have the, the most male-biased species and also the most female-biased dimorphism species. This is all occurring in a single genus. And you can see that variation occurring in this particular clade. And so I think it's saying that um, perhaps there's more complex processes at work in this genus um, compared to the other two um, subclades. Okay, so we're going to move on now and talk about the scaling relationship between <coughs> the body sizes of the sexes. So in general, um, to examine this kind of relationship, you take log transform body size data and you create a bivariate scatter plot. And here I put females, <coughs> it's a little hard to see, females on the x-axis and males are on the y-axis here. But this choice is arbitrary. You can use either or. It really doesn't matter. But I'm going to stick with this particular scheme. And on this plot, the dotted line represents equal sizes between the sexes. So if you were to draw lines from each of the respective body sizes, these are equal in terms of their measurement. Now the points above the line indicate that males are larger than the females, whereas below the line indicates that females are the larger sex. Now if you have your data points plotted here, you can perform a regression analysis, and the slope of the line indicates whether the body size relationship is isometric or allometric. And so just as some examples, um, one of the possible allometric relationships is when the slope is greater than 1, which is represented by the blue color here. And this is uh, Wrench's rule. So here as the species get larger, the males are increasing disproportionately in size compared to the females. A slope less than one is the converse of Wrench's rule. And in this case, as the species get larger, the females are actually increasing disproportionately in size relative <coughs> to males. And if the slope um, is one, you have sort of an increase in the sexes that's equal in magnitude or um, an isometric relationship. And so you can use these um, regression slopes as sort of an indicator of patterns of holometry. So the first thing I'm going to do is simply show you those data points that I collected. And I've color coded them by those subclades again. And you can see the distribution of these. So green again is cosinoids, uh, orange are the Afrixilis, and blue are the Hyperoleus. And again, um, we can see that there's a number of uh, species that have this male bias sexual size dimorphism. But a majority of those species are in that female bias dimorphism zone. And that's sort of the same thing that we've already seen with the, the size dimorphism index plot. But the one thing I really want to point out here is that there's considerably more variation in the genus Hyperoleus as compared to the other subclades. This is a pattern that's continuing to, to emerge in the analyses. And so um, I performed phylogenetic reduced major axis regressions. And these are designed to take phylogeny into account because these data points are not independent because these are related species. And so I did these regression analyses for the entire family, which is represented by the black line. I did these for um, the genus Afrixilis, which is represented by the orange line. And then I did this independently for the genus Hyperoleus, which is represented by the blue line. And the values listed in the boxes indicate the slope of those lines and a significance, um, that whether or not the, uh, the slope is significantly different than 1. And so a p-value greater than 0.05 indicates that the slope is not significantly different and is more likely um, to be isometric rather than uh, allometric. And so across all of these different analyses, I recover the same result, which is uh, isometric relationship. But in Hyperoleus, we actually see the, the biggest deep, or actually increase in slope. Um, and it's marginally not significant. But I don't want to make a big deal about this, because I don't actually think that Wrench's rule is occurring in this genus. I think this is more of a reflection of that high amount of variation <coughs> across the genus. Um, so. For me, this makes total sense, and it's sort of in line with what we know about frogs already. But again, I think um, sort of that variation in hyperoleus is being highlighted by these analyses. Okay, so let's move on to the last question here, 
So the results of the first two questions consistently demonstrated high variation occurring in the genus Hyperoleus, and really signaling that there's some complex patterns occurring. And so for this final question, I decided just to investigate the genus Hyperoleus by itself. So on this slide, I'm showing a phylogeny that's been trimmed to the genus Hyperoleus, and there's reconstructions of the male body size on the left and female body size on the right. And on these phylogenies, the red colors indicate small sizes and green are larger sizes, and yellow are sort of intermediate. And what you'll notice is that there's quite a bit of variation in the male body size relative to the female body size. And what I really wanted to figure out was whether these patterns could be explained by perhaps Brownian motion or an OU model, or maybe a more complex model of evolution. And so I, I initially did this across the entire uh, clade here, the entire genus. What I found was that the Brownian motion models were very poor fit. So in both cases, the OU model was, was selected. Um, now there are more complex models that can be fit to particular selective regimes within a clade. And these selective regimes can be defined based on some kind of phenotypic trait or you know, patterns of, um, of phylogenetic relationships. And so I wanted to sort of investigate this using this group. And so these models involve, um, for example, an OU model that can involve multiple optima, multiple selection strengths, and multiple stochastic rates, really accounting for the fact that in those <coughs> traits, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And so um, with these kinds of models, we can actually test whether the, the, the direction or the rate of change is different between these different selective regimes. And so choosing your selective regimes can be sort of arbitrary. And in this case, I just used the, um, the subclades that were best well-defined by the phylogenetic analyses. And in this case, I ended up with three of these selective <coughs> regimes. And so with these, I then performed these more complex model fits to see um, if there's additional explanations um, that can account for differences between these regimes. And so I'll first talk about the male body size. In this case, the OU model with multiple optima was selected. And so I've listed some of the parameters from this model. But essentially what's happening here is that each of these selective regimes has a different body size optimum. And so um, in some cases we see decreases in male body size for example, in clade one, and in clade two, we see directional selection for an increase in male body size. And in clade three is really sort of intermediate between the two, and it also has the most variation, which I guess is not too surprising. <coughs> However, in the females, the OU model with a single optimum was preferred. And so this is kind of an interesting comparison because what it's suggesting is that across these three clades, females have essentially the same optimal body size. And that's being maintained despite you know, phylogenetic relationships. And it seems like the males are actually doing something that's quite different. And so I, I thought this was a really interesting pattern. And it sort of speaks to the fact that perhaps it's the males, the changes in the male body sizes that are driving these major differences we're seeing in sexual size dimorphism across this genus. And so this is a, a more fine scale way of investigating which, uh, which sex is actually doing most of the changing. And so I began to think about what might be maintaining or driving these particular patterns across the genus. And I do have a few ideas, and they're, they're pretty, pretty early on in their development. And so I'd appreciate feedback about this sort of at the end of the talk here. But I have some, some unbridled speculation that I will raise <coughs> upon you. So one of the most interesting things to me is that there's consistency in female body size. And sexual selection theory would predict that there be increases in female body size um, associated with increased fecundity. And in this case, it seems like there might be some kind of constraint on this. Now, a vast majority of hyperoleus species utilize arboreal sites to place their eggs, which you can see in these, in these particular photos here. And often when they're doing this, it's on the ends of leaves. So these leaves are not very big either. I mean, these are leaves that are often the size of your hand or smaller. And so I think that this particular reproductive trait might actually be constraining the maximum body size of females because the vegetation may simply not support the weight of larger females, um, especially on the ends of these leaves where they're doing their overposition. And you can see this amplected pair of the Fritzlis are in the middle of starting to deposit their eggs. And you can see that the, the leaf that she chose is really quite small relative to her body size. And these frogs are you know, essentially fitting on my thumbnail. And so I think larger species would not be able to do this kind of behavior. 
and we might be seeing some kind of um, interplay between reproductive characters and, and habitat filtering. Now, I should say that hyperoleids are not the only arboreal group in Africa. There are other arboreal species, there's just far fewer of them. <clears throat> but the females of these other arboreal groups reach considerably larger sizes than hyperoleus. And so on the top, this is a, this is a large species of hyperoleus, which is fitting comfortably on my, my very dirty field thumb. <laughs> and then down here, this is a species of leptopulus, and you can see that the female is you know, a pretty significant portion of my entire hand. <coughs> Now, one of the interesting things here is that leptopulus are actually using terrestrial oviposition rather than arboreal oviposition. And I think that potentially this could be relaxing my hypothetical, my hypothetical constraint on the larger body sizes. And what we end up seeing, which is really bizarre, a lot of the males of leptopulus are in the same sort of body size range as male hyperoleus, but the females are drastically bigger. There's much more pronounced sexual size dimorphism here. And I think. Um, a partial explanation is simply the fact that these females, because they're depositing their eggs on the ground, can actually attain a much larger body size. And although this is you know, pretty speculative right now, I think that this can actually start being tested by characterizing the properties of the vegetation that's uh, sort of being selected by these females for their arboreal <coughs> position. We can start to characterize the, the body sizes of these females as well as their weight and we can try to determine if there are actually weight limitations on the vegetation um, after we have those kinds of data. But you know, overall, this is a, kind of an interesting pattern here that, that I have been thinking about for a little while, and I think there may be some body size constraints present due to reproductive mode, and it's definitely worth exploring more <laughs> in this group, but it's also worth exploring more generally across frogs, and I think we have some really nice comparisons that we can use to sort of investigate this topic more. Okay. Now, in contrast to the females, there's a lot of variation in male size and evidence for directional selection for increases and decreases in different subclades. And for the males, I think there are many processes at work, including interspecific resource partitioning, division of acoustic space, and reproductive character displacement. Now, at a given site, you can usually find 10 species of males, um, 10 species with males in sympatry. And these males are hanging out at these sites doing their calling behaviors, and sometimes they're here for really prolonged periods of time. And I think the fiercest competition between males is going to be intraspecific because they're competing intensely for mates. But I also think at these species-rich sites, there are males that are likely to be experiencing competition for calling sites, for food resources, and for shelters with similarly sized uh, hyperoleid species. And then this particular photo, these are, these are two different species, and they're basically occurring on top of each other. And with the same species, you could find them on, on the exact same leaf. You often see them fighting. There's essentially a ton of overlap in terms of the space that's being used across the groups. And oftentimes in these communities, we find species that are very closely related, sometimes sister taxa. And if you're almost identical to your sister taxon, the only way that you can really change your call without drastically altering your, uh, your morphology is to just change your body size. And this changes the call drastically. And so I think there might be this kind of reproductive character displacement occurring in these closely related pairs. And so um, we don't really know how long the breeding season lasts for a lot of these frogs, but it's possible that overall we see a lot of more fine scale partitioning occurring because of the competition both within species and between species at these breeding sites. And my initial exploration of body size distributions of males at this particular site indicated that there's very very little overlap in terms of body size distributions. There does seem to be some kind of signal there that these species are really partitioning up the morphospace. space. And so I have a lot more body size data for other species rich sites. And this is a pattern that I'm going to try and explore with those data before thinking about perhaps the behavioral or, or ecological studies that need to be done to really get at the bottom of this. But in general, I think that the, the males are more complicated. And we really don't know enough about ecology to really answer this question right now. Okay, so now we're going to change gears here and talk about um, a really fascinating trait in hyperoleas, which is uh, sexual dichromatism. And so, more generally speaking, sexual dichromatism is simply sexual dimorphism in coloration, where you have males and females that have different color hues, brightness, or patterns. And this trait hadn't really been 
know, well characterized in frogs for a long time, um, until recently um, when Raina Bell and Kelly Zamudio wrote an excellent review paper on the topic. And in this paper, they summarize a lot of information about the occurrence of this trait across all frogs. And so, in this paper, they've confirmed that sexual dichromatism occurs in at least 120 species, and that's of maybe a couple thousand species that they were able to get information for. But there are 6,500 species of frogs, and there's a ton of species that we simply don't know this kind of information about yet. And so this is definitely a conservative estimate, and it's on the lower end. But one thing that um, Raina and Kelly did, which I thought was really, really awesome, was defining specific types of dichromatism that are present. And this really helps a lot of researchers begin to think about the evolution of this, this type of trait across frogs. And they fall basically into two categories. So the first is dynamic dichromatism. And this is the kind of uh, difference in coloration that's temporary. And so often this occurs during the breeding season. And you can see examples of this on the right. Um, so usually, but not always, it's the male that has the brighter coloration. And this sort of occurs, um, the time period varies. It can be a few, a few hours to uh, several weeks. But it occurs during the breeding season, and it's thought to be a signal for, for the females and being involved in mate recognition, as well as sort of um, kind of ameliorate the effects of uh, intrasexual conflict between the males. But um, this was documented for at least 30 species in nine different families. And the second kind of dichromatism is ontogenetic. And so this is sort of more permanent in nature. And color changes are triggered um, at sexual, sexual maturity where um, steroid hormones can drive um, change in color in one or both of the sexes. But in this particular case, it would be both of the sexes. And this has been documented in at least 90 species in 18 families. But the really interesting thing is that 50% of those species are hyperolea frogs. Okay, and in these particular species, what we often find is that the juvenile coloration is retained in the males at maturity, and the females undergo these drastic color changes. Now, that's sort of a simplistic overview of ontogenetic dichromatism. The story is actually much more messy in hyperoleids. Um, this is something that I have a lot of experience now seeing in the field, and um, I'm going to kind of characterize some of the other unique properties of these, these frogs. So here is a, a species, Hyperoleus rigenbachii, which I've collected um, three times now in Cameroon. And this is the general pattern for the females, and this is the, the most common form of the males. So they have these sort of stripes, and the females have these mottled colors that um, are really beautiful. Now, in addition to that normal form, there's also a female-colored male form that can occur. And the coloration is, is really close to that of the, the female, right? And so there are some subtle differences. But in general, if you were to look between the males, you would, you would say that that would most likely be a female if you didn't know any better. And in these species where this, this uh, female colored male occur, it's generally in much lower frequency. And so they're never more abundant than the typical colored male. And the frequency of these morphs can vary drastically across species. So in some species, it's maybe one in every 20 frogs. In some, I've documented it's one in every 300 frogs. And so we see differences in frequencies across species. And some of them don't even have this male that has the female coloration. And so the immediate question that comes to mind is whether this is related to the mating system. Perhaps if the female colored males are satellite males or sneaker males or something like that. And I do have some observations about this. Um, I've observed both types of these males calling. I found both types in amplexus with females. Um, they have all the typical male traits. So in hyperoleids, there's this uh, Guller gland, which is present on males. It's a really easy sign that you have a male. And the Guller gland is um, basically identical in, in superficial morphology between the two forms, suggesting that there's nothing weird going on there. Um, the Guller gland may or may not be secreting pheromones. We have no idea yet. But there's some speculation about that. In addition um, to the behavioral similarities, I can't find any morphological differences between the two forms um, based on the measurements that I've taken. And I have 15 body size um, and shape measurements across these species. So they're very similar in, in most regards. And they seem to have relatively similar successes in mating. And I used to think that these different male colorations were permanent and occurred at sexual maturity. But I 
started to find more and more intermediate male forms in the field. And this particular species, um, Dave Blackburn and I collected to bring back to the Calicad live to start a breeding colony and also put on display. You can see these guys at the Color of Life exhibit right now at the Calicad, if you want to check them out, they're really beautiful. And in 2013, we brought back a bunch of these. We brought back a lot of normal males and we brought back several <coughs> of the female colored males. And over time, those female colored males transitioned to the normal coloration, so it disappeared completely. And so now we're thinking that this might be a seasonal color change, or it might even be a polyphenism. But we have no idea what would be driving this. We, we know very little about the reproductive biology of these frogs. And these are just two examples of males that we found in the field that have this sort of intermediate coloration. You could see these stripes kind of coming through the, the female coloration <coughs> on these males. So there's lots of questions, but where, where do we begin? So what we really need to do is, is start with some of the basic questions. And we need an understanding of the overall evolution of sexual dichromatism across the family. So for my dissertation, I focused on two very simple questions. How prevalent is sexual dichromatism? And are there multiple origins of sexual dichromatism? And this is work that um, Rain and I have been collaborating with closely. So for the first question, Raina and I updated her database with our observations of species in the field based on our you know, experiences. And for species that we haven't seen in the field, I used information um, based on the specimens I was measuring in museums. And also, we did a pretty thorough literature search to find any additional information. And so we don't have complete information for all the species, but we've made substantial progress. And so we have estimates for about 138 of these species now. And what we found was that 67 of these lineages were monochromatic, so no difference. And we have now 71 lineages that are dichromatic. And this is a pretty big increase from the conservative estimate of 40 species. And it indicates that this might actually be the dominant form across the whole family. So with this information, um, I was able to map the character onto the phylogeny I generated. And so this is a little bit hard to see here, but um, gray are, the gray boxes at the tips represent monochromatic species, and the black boxes represent dichromatic species. Um, using this information, I estimated ancestral character states using stochastic character mapping. And the tiny pie charts that you see are the posterior probabilities for each state at a given node. Um, I don't want you to squint too hard, I'm going to highlight most of the major findings here. So the first most, most basic thing is what was the common ancestor of this group? And this particular analysis inferred that it's actually monochromatic, which is kind of, um, kind of interesting. But this is the condition of most frogs, so I guess it's not too surprising. The other thing is that there's multiple origins of sexual dichromatism. But in greater frequency, there's actually multiple reversals to monochromatism from dichroma, dichromatic groups. And so that was kind of a surprising result. I should point out that dichromatism is actually completely absent from certain clades. So in the Cassinoids and in the genus of Phryxus, we don't have any species that are dichromatic. And overall, there seem to be two key transitions to dichromatism across the family. And given the ancestral state of the family is monochromatic, these represent independent origins of dichromatism rather than the retention of a plesiomorphic state. And so one of those transitions happened in the common ancestor of the Malagasy and Seychelles Island species, Heterixilis and Tachinemus. These are uh, Heterixilis females and males. These are Tachinemus males and females. And this is a group that's not that diverse. There's only about 12 species. Um, but these are island forms, right? So this is not on the mainland. But the other transition did occur on the mainland in the common ancestor of Hyperoleus, Morarella, and Cryptothylax. And together, Morarella and Cryptothylax only have about three species, whereas Hyperoleus, we have 150 species. And so in the Hyperoleus, we see the most number of reversals back to monochromatism, although there are some examples of this happening in Heterixilis, the, uh, the Malagasy species. But there's a really a tremendous amount of variation occurring in Hyperoleus. And so, as with any system, this opens up a whole bunch of new questions. And um, the comparison between the independent origin of the mainland uh, dichromatism and the island dichromatism, to me, is really fascinating. And I think we can work with that um, as a comparative framework for further exploring the trait. But some of the questions that we're thinking about now, um, has this trait influenced diversification rates? When you eyeball it, you want to say yes. But I think we still need to actually quantify this using more rigorous models. Um, perhaps the most interesting question to me is what selective forces are promoting either the retention 
or the loss of sexual dichromatism in hyperoleids. We see it evolving, but we also see it lost many times, and then secondarily re-evolving. I think we don't really understand what's driving this. Um, we don't know if dichromatism is involved in species recognition or mating, but in birds at least, this does seem to be an important role for, um, for species recognition. We haven't quantified whether there are true behavioral differences in males with the alternate color patterns. I think there's a lot of room there, both in captivity and in the wild. But um, perhaps the most interesting as well, at the end of this, is what is the molecular basis of the trait? Because we have these two independent origins, it would be really interesting to see if the same sort of genetic underpinnings are driving both of those, or whether we see a molecular convergence in a, in a different fashion. And so these are all questions that we're interested in pursuing. Um, and I'll tell you just very quickly about um, some of the ongoing work that we have <clears throat> to try and address some of these topics. So my last trip to Cameroon, um, we selectively sampled species that are dichromatic. Um, two of these species have the males <laughs> that have the female coloration. And in this species, we found a lot of transitional males. And we also have a nice comparison of two species that are dichromatic but don't have this female colored male form. And what I've done is uh, sample the skin of these individuals. And so I preserved the skin in such a way that we can look at the chemical content as well as gene expression. And I think um, this is going to help us to figure out if there are actually biological differences in the skin of these animals. And perhaps um, if there are, what are the, the genes that are sort of regulating these kinds of differences? which is kind of a, an interesting avenue to go. In addition to that, we've taken a lot of other tissue types, including eyeballs, which I know Stubbs is pretty excited about. And so we have those, and we can explore you know, opsin, opsin genes, and also just kind of get a profile of um, sort of what's happening in the hyperolean eye, which can help us figure out some of the questions related to species recognition. Um, in addition to this kind of work, um, we're also trying to set up breeding colonies of hyperoleus Rigenbachii the one that's at the cow cat, and those frogs are starting to reproduce. So we're working on getting a captive colony going. And um, we also have um, the heterixla species in the works for captive breeding, too. And I think having those um, controlled colonies would allow more fine-scale manipulations. And the thing that I'm most excited to try, and Rain is most excited to try, are hormonal manipulations to see if we can actually uh, induce these color changes, both in the juveniles and in the adults. Um, but there's, there's plenty left to do here. So um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about uh, the system. I hope I've convinced you that, that hyperoleids are pretty amazing. And uh, they're a really, really great group for comparative evolutionary studies. Um, there's a ton left to do, including within the topics of sexual size dimorphism and sexual dichromatism, as well as a, a whole plethora of other topics. But really, the foundation for this work has been establishing the evolutionary relationships of the family, which was one of the main components of my dissertation. And so I'm continuing this work, and I'm looking forward to continuing this work. Um, and I'm happy to have such enthusiastic collaborators like Dave Blackburn and, and Raina Bell to work with in the future. And um, with that, I have tons and tons of people to thank. Um, <coughs> I think the, the image of me pulling the barge across the river is, is true. That does sort of simulate a PhD, but what is not shown are the people who are towing the rope behind me. And I think that that is really you know, the thing that needs to be said right now. And so the MDZ has basically been a, a support network and a family while I've been here. Um, I want to thank Jim for you know, basically giving me complete independence and believing that at the end of my six years, I would come up with something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that took a lot of faith on your end, um, especially when I first got here. And you know, they say that the MVZ, you never really leave. So I'm looking forward to continuing to interact with, with everyone here. And uh, thank you for coming. And by time, I'll take some. Thank you. Thank you. So you may want to give people just a moment to step out and talk to their classes and such.
Um, you didn't talk about it so much in this talk, but I know that there's quite a high level of intraspecific poly color polymorphism. polymorphism. Um, to what degree do you think is that a result of hybridization between species? Excellent question. Um, we don't know the limits of most of the species on the mainland, but um, Reno's work has demonstrated very clearly that a lot of these color polymorphisms can be generated through hybrid zones. And so I suspect that similar to the islands, there might be this going on in the mainland as well. But um, the species limits are, are still so diffuse that I think we need to really get in there with molecular data and figure that out first before we can start addressing that kind of question. Carol? Um, with the Rigenbaki, the ones that are, you know, you have in captivity over at Calicad, do you think it's possible there's some kind of environmental cue that's making them change back to their regular male coloration since they're in captivity and not out in the wild? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great question. If it's a polyphenism, it could, it could be induced by population density of males. Um, this is, I didn't mention it, but hyperoles are also thought to, to undergo protogenous sex change. And this is a case where females are turning into males, and this is in response to a low abundance of males. Um, so I think the same kind of thing could be possible, but we don't actually know if, it's a, if, it, if it is a true polyphenism yet, or if there's something else going on. But the color is hormonally regulated, and so it says that there, there might be something interesting. That was my sort of my question too, and I'm wondering if you're going to try to set up experiments where you can man manipulate the possible parameters that are <coughs> influencing it, because it sounds like a you know a, a nice system to be yeah. manipulating to see how this works. Yeah. In other words, ha have you looked at? Are there any changes related to the color pattern of the other males that are there? In other words, is there a value in being a different kind of male than the typical or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> those are all great questions. <laughs> um, and I, I think the only thing that I, I really can say in response is just what we've observed by taking these animals into captivity, noticing that these color differences are not permanent, particularly in the female colored males. It may have something to do with population density, but um, if it is a polyphenism, we can try and figure out what the reaction norm is by changing the density of males um, with different kinds of coloration. But in order to do those kinds of experiments, we really need a, a large colony, and that's something that we're, we're desperately trying to work on right now. But they are being bred in captivity. You can produce that. Uh, they have bred at the Calicat, yeah. So in the display, there are several tadpoles um, that are starting to mature. Um, another explanation for small body size in males relative to females is a uh, situation where females are uh, scattered, uh, and so males have to move quickly uh, from location to location to find females. Um, so one thing you might look at is perhaps the locomotory apparatus. So small body size is presumed to represent an energetic savings in terms of movement. Yeah. The other is if those are you know sneaker males. You might look at the testes as well, the size of the testes, um, because those small males may have fewer reproductive opportunities, and they may basically be sperm bombs jumping around waiting for females. <laughs> right. That's, a, that's an excellent observation. Um, in terms of small, uh, small male body size, too, I think one of the things to consider is the, the energetic constraints on males um, imposed by their reproductive behaviors, but also the fact that there's usually higher predation rates on the males. And amphibians have indeterminate growth for the most part. And I think um, part of what's been partly proposed in the past is that sexual size dimorphism is a result of high predation on older males. They just simply don't last as long mm -hmm. because they're out calling and things like that. So it's sort of artificially changing this, this dimorphism index. Um, and we don't know anything about the age structure of these communities to really say much about that. But I think the mobility hypothesis is a really good one. You mentioned reproductive character displacement as a possibility for the evolution of male size. And you said that in individual sites, you saw non-overlapping sizes of, among the different species. 
Are there species that have partially overlapping ranges so that you can compare populations in sympatry and in allopatry to see if there's greater differences in size in, in sympatry? I mean, that would be a yeah. prediction of, of, of the model. Right. Um, it's difficult in some cases because we do have such high turnover of species between regions. Um, and so usually the, the assemblages are unique to particular locations. Um, there are some more widespread species, and I think that would be a good place to start to target those and see if their morphology is changing over the range with their interactions with other species, too. Jim? Okay. Um, so I'm just, this frog is so crazy. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm interested in how the females are, so I guess is, is all of the, the, uh, the reproductive decision, the mating decision made by the female? Does the female approach the male and that's how the male recognizes the female that he's going to mate with? I mean, how do males recognize, do you have any idea how males recognize females in this system? Looking Given at, that there can be like 12 species in one place, and yeah, and the females look so different compared to the males. Yeah, I'm looking at them. Right seen one approach of a female to a male and that was in a species of a frixilis and the male was calling several males were calling and she came up the the same piece of vegetation that he was on and, and met him and he didn't move towards her and then they had an elaborate courtship display and movement and then at some point she made a misstep and accidentally kicked him in the head and he fell off. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the elaborate courtship? Yeah. Um, there's there's sort of a straddling walk that's done and um, the Frixlis are leaf folding species, so they lay their eggs and then they roll leaves over top to cover them. And so there's like a very sort of specific ritual that they do before they get yeah. into place for that. I mean, that might be really important, right? I don't know how common that is in frogs, and that may make a, I mean, Do you ever find um, interspecific anaplexis, like you know, the wrong species? Yeah, so Raina, Raina has seen this a fair amount, but I've never encountered it especially in these really dense communities that I'm visiting. I've always found the same correct amplexus across species, which I, I think says something a lot about mate recognition. Yeah. Yeah. And the females are the ones that are most drastically different in coloration. Um, if you look at the males, they're all kind of more bland colors, which I think might have something to do with, with camouflage on the leaves that they're calling on. The idea that males vary in vocalization and females vary in color seems potentially relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought your idea of the, the limitation on female body size because they're laying the eggs on the leaves was interesting, um, especially because, so you talked about how there would be different pressures on the males versus the females for body size, and together those lead to the degree of sexual size dimorphism you see. Um, but if the females are, if the females lay eggs while in amplexus, right with the yeah. males yeah. so it's actually the net body weight that's contributing so I was wondering how the size of the males I wonder if there's also a pressure for the smaller your male is the bigger your female is with the same net body size right and the smaller foliage you can lay eggs on right yeah that's an excellent point and it's something that um, we currently can't quantify because we haven't really taken body weight measurements on these frogs but now it makes me wish that we had <laughs> um, but yeah, that, you're right. The, the fact that the male is there participating, I mean, there's definitely constraints probably on both of the sexes, not just the female. Um, but it is interesting to see that the only other arboreal kinds of frogs, the males are still relatively small, but the females can get enormous. Yeah. And I think that that comparison is really what led me to that conclusion. But yeah, it's speculative. So many questions. <laughs> uh, ben, you have your hand up. Um, I was... Uh, I was really interested to hear that that the that St. Patrick species can be sister. Um, I guess I guess uh, I'm wondering how common that is, and if you if you think that in cases where they are St. Patrick and sister, if that leads to you know, increased 
divergence in terms of color, behavior, you know, whatever whatever characters you can find. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, these species here all belong to the same clade, which only has maybe like seven or eight species total. And you can see that the males all have these yellow lateral stripes for the most part, and the females are the <coughs> ones that are differing drastically. And so um, this would be a really interesting system to, to look at that in. There are other groups of hyperoids that are less colorful and some that are monochromatic, which would suggest that maybe um, coloration isn't as important for mate recognition and things like that. But this would be an interesting place to start because there are several sites where sister taxa within this group co-occur. Yeah. But we really haven't tried to quantify it yet. Steps? So in other areas of the world, you get frogs that will lay uh, eggs above water on like solid leaves and sticks and things like that. Do you ever see that in hyperoleids? And that seems like it could be a way to escape that potential limitation of body size to the bigger ones, maybe, you know, like sturdier things. Or it's yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So outside of Hyperoleus and Afrixilus, within the Cassinoids, they tend to have the largest body sizes of the family, and those frogs are actually depositing their eggs underwater on vegetation. And so they're, they're going into the pond and they're actually swimming down and laying their eggs underneath the water. And so I think um, that's one example of, of perhaps how Larger body size might be obtained by changing over position site, but like, aren't rainas They're tiny. I've collected they're tiny, them, so but they are tree hole breeders, and so you do get these one-offs where things are not necessarily using vegetation, and there are some that are using um, trees overhanging streams instead of you know, aquatic plants in pond systems. So there's a lot of variation across the entire group. And I'm just kind of making, um, you know, some more generalizations to, to try to explain the pattern that I think might be there. But there are definitely examples of, of some hyperolids that are using, not leaves, but maybe more, um, more the base of plants or, or other kinds of structures too. Do you ever get events of like premature hatching in the eggs if they're on those? Like, do you sort of think of it as? more vibratory sensitive things like, like using cleavers if the snakes start eating the eggs or anything like that. Does that happen? I mean you have to have really careful observations of the egg masses through time to, to observe that. And usually when we're there we're just getting a snapshot. So it's, it's hard to say. It could be happening but we just don't know. It hasn't been documented. Let's take maybe one more question. Carol had her hand up. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, mine's short, or we could talk about it later. But uh, I was really interested in the Goulard glands, since that's something that all the hyperoleids have. But I don't think a lot of other frogs have those, right? I mean, it's right. sort of rare. It's an yeah. Family, yeah. And so, do you? I mean, do those form in the females that turn into males later? And yes. are the okay? And are they present at when they become sexually active in the males? Like, do they not have them as juveniles, and then they, they show up later? Yeah. It's a secondary sexual characteristic just yeah. for males. Because, yeah, it, yeah, it's really interesting, like, did those change color or size or how are those related to any of these factors and what do they actually do? Right. Yeah. Um, there was a paper published on the, um, the chemical composition of the Guller gland. However, they didn't include any kind of control from other skin. Yeah. So the only thing that they demonstrated was that there's stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've been sampling a lot of Guller glands and we sent it to the same lab that did the initial analysis. And they're, they're going to include those, as well as the control skin that we took on the back of the animal, to see if there are differences, not just you know, between species of the gland, but also of the gland to the rest of the skin of the animal, which right. I think is the most important component. Yeah. So hopefully we'll know soon, but I don't really have any, any speculation on that. Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, so Dan's third finishing talk will be next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Decided I might have to give one last herpert. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>